On February 21st, Australian police finally caught the convicted murderer Graham Potter, who had been on the run for 12 years. A convicted killer, he had been evading conspiracy to murder charges since 2010. Investigators later found out that he had attempted to change his appearance and demeanour to avoid detection, but was eventually found in a dilapidated house in Ravenshoe in the far north of Queensland. Potter, however, is one of many criminals who go on the run and manage to avoid capture for years, sometimes even decades. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two terrifying cases of criminals still on the run. Valeri Andreev Born April 10th, 1957, Valeri Andreev is better known in his home country of Russia as the Orsk Maniac. Raised in the village of Shalkarsky, not much is documented about Valeri's childhood. Upon leaving school, he became a trucker and, on the surface, appeared to live an ordinary and well-intentioned life. He was married, had two children, and was not known to abuse substances or alcohol. His friends and family valued him and spoke highly of him, but all that changed in the mid-2000s, when he appeared to begin behaving differently, becoming distant and isolated, preferring to work alone on long-haul drives, and not engaging with his colleagues and friends the way he once did. It wasn't until 2012 that Russian investigators began to suspect there was more to Valeri than met the eye. In June that year, 18-year-old Olga Zorovloyeva disappeared. Witnesses last saw the young woman entering a white SUV, and the vehicle was captured on CCTV. It was later spotted in the city of Orsk. Luckily for investigators, the vehicle was far from commonplace. Only two such SUVs were registered in the city. One of them belonged to Valeri. Investigating the 55-year-old truck driver further, Authorities learned that Valeri had been in the same location as Olga shortly before she vanished. This could be proven using his mobile phone data. Valeri was arrested and detained in connection with Olga's disappearance a month later, but was ultimately released. However, his vehicle, company truck, and garage were all searched during his time in custody, and they showed traces of human DNA and blood. When his colleagues were approached, they reported that they had assumed the trucker had begun to use the services of sex workers, because contraceptives, jewellery, women's underwear, hair accessories, and other feminine items were often found in his vehicle. Valeri was asked to appear for questioning again, but he didn't come to the police station. He was last heard from on July 6th, 2012, when he contacted his wife, and has not been seen or heard from since. Valeri's profession as a long-haul truck driver allowed him to access all sorts of routes and different areas of the country. After he was reported missing, an extensive search was launched with the aim that he could be tracked down before he attempted to leave the country, but no sign of him was ever found. The remains of his last confirmed victim, Olga, were found on September 10th, 2013. In the years since he vanished, law enforcement has received dozens of calls and messages about possible sightings of Valery, which indicate that he may still be in Russia, or as nearby as Kazakhstan. Several areas in and around Russia have been searched in response to the tips received by investigators, but so far, the authorities have come away empty-handed each time. One of the most recent sightings of Valeri was in October 2019, when he was positively identified in the Luga district of the Leningrad Oblast region of Russia. The witness who saw him reported the sighting to several law enforcement bodies, but despite residents of the area confirming that they had also seen him, no actions were taken to capture and detain Valeri by the Ministry of Internal Affairs or the Investigative Committee. At the end of that year, Interpol decided to take up the search for the elusive serial killer. In 2020, when Interpol announced they were searching for Valeri, he was placed at the top of their list of wanted fugitives. A reward, the equivalent of 20,000 US dollars, was offered for information on his whereabouts. In 2021, 
A witness reported seeing Valeri near Moscow. Valeri is now aged 65 and is linked to the rapes and murders of eight women. However, he is suspected of killing more than 100 women between 2006 and 2016. If he was truly responsible for such a horrific number of crimes, then Valeri would be Russia's deadliest serial killer and one of the worst in the world. Valeri Andreev is still missing. He is described as a white male with graying hair who stands at five foot six inches tall. He has a five centimeter scar on his abdomen. He is currently 65 years old. If you have any information about Valeri's whereabouts, you can contact your local police station or use the Interpol message form, which will be linked in the description. Sharon Kinney. Sharon Elizabeth Hall was born on November 30th, 1939 in Independence, Missouri to parents Eugene and Doris. Following her birth, Sharon spent some time growing up in Washington state, but by the age of 15, she and her family had returned to her birthplace. In 1956, now aged 16, she met 22-year-old Brigham Young University student James Kinney at a church function. The couple dated from the summer that year until the autumn when James returned to university. However, shortly after his departure, Sharon penned the 22-year-old a letter explaining that she had fallen pregnant with his child. James felt it was his responsibility to now look after Sharon and the child, and so he returned to independence, and the couple married on October 18, 1956. Sharon's age was falsely listed as 18 at the time. About a year after they married, the pair had a second, more formal wedding. By this time, Sharon, who had not actually been pregnant in the first place, had explained away her lack of baby by claiming she'd miscarried. However, she did eventually end up pregnant, giving birth to a daughter named Dana in the autumn of 1957. Following their second wedding ceremony, Sharon and James spent some time living in Provo, Utah, before returning to Independence, where they both got jobs, Sharon as a babysitter and James as an electrical engineer at Bendix Aviation where he mostly worked nights. Sharon was keen on a life of luxury. She often spent large sums of money on frivolous things and attempted to live well beyond her means. She and James initially lived in a rented home next to his parents, but eventually built their own home, a ranch style house elsewhere in the city. Eventually, Sharon grew restless. She'd had another baby, a boy named Troy, and she'd become bored of being a mother and a wife and yearned for excitement. As her husband was always working nights, she turned her attention to other men and began engaging in affairs. One of these relationships was with an old high school friend, John Bolditz. By 1960, James was considering divorcing Sharon. He suspected that she was carrying on with other men and was also frustrated by her reckless spending habits. On March 18th, he spoke with his parents about the matter. Devout Mormons, James's parents encouraged him to stay and make their marriage work. He told them that Sharon would agree to the divorce if she was able to retain the house, keep custody of their daughter, and he paid her $1,000 in alimony. Still, James's parents insisted that the couple had simply hit a rough patch and just needed time to sort things out together. The next day, at around 5.30 p.m., Sharon heard a gunshot ring out from the direction of the master bedroom. She would later tell the police that when she went to investigate, she discovered the couple's two-year-old daughter, Dana, sitting on the bed next to her father. He had a gunshot wound to his head, and Dana was holding his 22 caliber handgun. According to Sharon, James must have been cleaning the weapon when he decided to take a nap. He must have left the gun out as he went to sleep. Emergency services were promptly called to the scene, but James was declared dead by the time he arrived at the hospital. After his death, law enforcement began to investigate the incident. They were unable to obtain prints from the pistol's grip, however, and then failed to carry out testing for gunshot residue on both Sharon and Dana. Speaking with friends and relatives of the family, investigators discovered that the two-year-old was known to play with firearms unattended, and in a test carried out by the police, Dana proved her ability to pull the trigger on a gun, which was the same make and model of her father's. As there was no evidence to prove it was anything else, James's death was ruled as an accidental homicide. 
After the investigation was closed, James was buried, and his wife collected on his life insurance policies, which were both the modern day equivalent of around $230,000. Using this money, Sharon bought herself a new Ford Thunderbird from a car salesman named Walter T. Jones on April 18th. Walter and Sharon began an affair shortly thereafter. While Sharon wanted to get married again and thought Walter would be the perfect second husband, he already had a wife, 23-year-old Patricia Jones, his high school sweetheart with whom he had two children. In May that year, Sharon asked Walter to go to Washington with her. However, he declined her offer and so she took her brother Eugene instead. Upon her return, she met up with her boyfriend and told him that she was pregnant with his baby. Sharon was sure that this would tip the scale in her favor, that Walter would have a strong reason to leave his wife and be with her, but Walter didn't announce that he would divorce his wife. Instead, he ended the couple's affair. Following the breakup on May 26th, Sharon decided to call Patricia and tell her that her husband was having an affair with Sharon's sister. The pair met to discuss the situation that evening, and according to Sharon, she dropped Patricia off a few blocks from home afterwards but Walter reported that his wife never made it back to their house. He alerted the police to her uncharacteristic disappearance the following morning. Once he had notified the authorities, he began to call Patricia's friends and loved ones, looking for somebody who may have seen her. One of her friends, who carpooled to and from work with her, informed him that the 23-year-old had discussed being approached by a woman who wanted to meet her. Patricia asked the carpool driver to drop her on a street corner in Independence, and the friend had noticed another woman waiting in a car nearby. They didn't recognize the woman, but gave Walter her description, which was immediately familiar to him. After hanging up, Walter called Sharon and asked if she had seen or spoken with his wife. She admitted that she had, and informed him that she'd told Patricia of the affair. She then claimed that she'd last seen the 23-year-old when she dropped her off near their house. Sharon said that Patricia began speaking with an unknown man in a green 1957 Ford shortly before Sharon drove off. Walter and Sharon met later that evening, where he insisted that she provide more details about Patricia's last known movements. He would later admit that he'd threateningly held a key to Sharon's throat. That same day, on May 27th, shortly before midnight, Sharon and John Bolditz, whom she had an ongoing affair with, discovered Patricia's body in a secluded lover's lane outside the city. She had been shot four times by a 22 caliber pistol, sustaining two wounds to her shoulder and one to her abdomen. The fatal shot was to Patricia's head. The bullet entered near her mouth at an upwards trajectory. She is estimated to have died at 9 p.m. on May 27th. Powder burns on the hemline of Patricia's skirt, which had been pushed up to her waist, indicated that the gun had been fired at close range at least once, and a white powdery substance discovered in her hair led investigators to initially theorize that she had been killed elsewhere and dumped in the secluded area. However, it was later determined that the substance was fly eggs. As no other crime scene could be located, the notion that this was not the crime scene was dismissed. Authorities attempted to locate the murder weapon and the bullet which had passed through Patricia's abdomen. They searched the lover's lane with the help of a group of Boy Scouts, but they were never able to recover the weapon, despite going so far as to empty nearby bodies of water. The bullet, however, was eventually discovered buried in the ground underneath the body. On May 28th, Walter, Sharon, and John were all questioned. Both John and Walter admitted to dating Sharon in written statements. On June 1st, they both took polygraph tests, which they passed. Sharon, however, would not put anything down in writing and refused to take a polygraph. Her brother, Eugene, was also questioned on March 31st, although he opted not to talk to investigators. That same day, at 11 p.m., Sharon was arrested for Patricia's murder. The Jackson County Sheriff caught wind of her arrest and asked the prosecutors to consider a second murder, that of James Kinney. Following her arrest, Sharon was released on a $20,000 bond. Her preliminary hearing was scheduled for June 16th. Meanwhile, the gun used in the death of her husband was ruled out as being the murder weapon in Patricia's case. It was still locked up and under the possession of the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. Reportedly, after James's death, Sharon attempted to get the gun back, but it was never returned to her. 
A male friend of hers then came forward and admitted that he'd purchased a 22 caliber handgun for the widow and registered it under her name, but she had asked him to re-register it under another. However, the weapon couldn't be found inside her house. Sharon originally claimed that she had lost it on her trip to Washington, then recanted this story and said it had gone missing at some point. In mid-June, Sharon's trial was delayed as she was heavily pregnant with her third child. She gave birth to a second daughter, Marla, on January 16th, 1961. On June 13th, 1961, Sharon's trial for the murder of Patricia Jones began. The prosecution cited both Walter and a police lieutenant named Harry Nesbitt as evidence of the motive behind the crime. Nesbitt recalled that Sharon had stated, I was afraid I was losing him, he acted funny. Meanwhile, Walter told the court about how he had broken off the relationship after Sharon told him that she was pregnant. The prosecution alleged that Patricia had been killed because Sharon wanted Walter all to herself. However, they were unable to firmly establish if she owned or had once owned the handgun that killed the 23-year-old. After calling 27 witnesses, the prosecution rested its case on June 21st. Meanwhile, Sharon's defense team focused on breaking down the motive and means of the crime, claiming the mother of three had no reason to kill Patricia and stating that the weapon that allegedly belonged to her had not been proven to be the murder weapon. The jury spent just over an hour and a half deliberating before acquitting Sharon of the charge. They had found too many loopholes in the prosecution's case. Bizarrely, immediately after the verdict was announced, one juror asked Sharon for her autograph. She obliged before she was returned to jail to await the next trial. On January 8th, 1962, the jury selection process began for Sharon's second murder trial. The prosecution's case heavily relied on their contention that she was so interested in seeing her husband gone from her life that she was willing to pay for it. They had John Balditz testify about the time that Sharon had offered to pay him $1,000 to kill her husband. However, John undermined his own testimony by claiming that Sharon may have been joking. This caused the prosecution to attack the character of their own witness. The prosecution also explained that James and Sharon's marriage was on the verge of breaking down at the time of his death and noted that she'd been engaging in extramarital affairs, which had caused the divide between the couple. They pointed out that Sharon would only be able to collect James's life insurance money if she was still his wife. Sharon's defense for their part focused on the fact that much of the evidence in the case was circumstantial and called John Balditz a poor mixed up kid who would sign anything and attacked the reliability of his testimony. They also observed that the police during their original investigation had thought James's demise was obviously accidental and presented testimony which supported the idea that James had often left guns in reach of his children and that Dana could pull triggers on toy guns which were stiffer than the one on the 22 caliber which had killed him. The jury deliberated for over five and a half hours before returning a guilty verdict on January 11th. In April, Sharon was sentenced to life in prison and began to serve time in the Missouri Reformatory for Women. Her deceased husband's family continued to believe that Dana had been responsible for the death and that it had been nothing more than a tragic accident, stating, we still don't feel that she committed murder. Sharon, for her part, told reporters that the verdict was a mistake. A week after her conviction, Sharon's lawyers requested that she be released on bond, which was supported by a petition signed by 132 individuals who thought she was innocent. However, the motion was denied as first degree murder was not a bailable offense. In response, Sharon's defense then requested that the conviction be vacated because the jury had delivered a verdict based on surmise and speculation rather than substantial evidence. They went on to list some errors that they alleged had been made before and during the trial. While this was denied by a judge in April 1962, the Missouri Supreme Court reversed the conviction in March 1963. A new trial was ordered on the basis of Sharon's defense having been denied adequate preemptory challenges during jury selection. She was denied bail in May that year, but two months later was released on a $25,000 bond, which had been posted by her brother. As her second trial was scheduled, Sharon and her three children moved in with her mother. 
Her next trial began on March 23, 1964, but a mistrial was declared shortly afterwards because a law partner of one of the prosecutors had once been retained by one of the jurors. Sharon's third trial started on June 29th that year. A new witness testified for the prosecution, a female acquaintance of the mother of three, who stated Sharon once joked that the witness should, quote, get rid of the woman's old man like Sharon did. During this trial, Sharon took the stand to declare that she was innocent of all charges. A second mistrial was declared when the jury deadlocked seven to five in favor of acquittal. Her fourth trial was scheduled for October of 1964. However, while free on bail, Sharon traveled to Mexico with her alleged new lover, a man named Francis Puglias. She left her children in the care of their grandfather and traveled under the pretense that she and Francis were a married couple, using the name Jeanette Puglias. Technically, although the bail itself wouldn't have prevented Sharon from traveling out of the state, the company that posted her bail prohibited her from doing so without explicit written consent from themselves. Thus, her going out of state went against the conditions the company had set. In Mexico, Sharon and Francis registered as a married couple at Hotel Gin. While in the country, Sharon purchased a weapon, claiming that she felt unsafe as she was unfamiliar with Mexico. However, she and Francis had also brought one to two weapons with them across the border, so it's unclear why Sharon required a third gun. On the night of September 18th, 1964, the mother of three left the hotel alone. While out, she encountered Francisco Ordonez, a Mexican-born US citizen at a bar. She went back to his hotel with him, later telling the police that he had wanted to show her some photographs he had taken. However, in the hotel room, Sharon claimed, Francisco made sexual advances towards her, and so she fired her gun at him in self-defense. She stated that she simply wanted to scare him off. Instead, she shot him in the chest, killing him immediately. The sound of the gunfire drew the attention of a hotel employee who entered the room and narrowly avoided being killed by Sharon too. The employee was shot in the shoulder and he promptly fled the scene, closing the door behind him, locking Sharon in the room until authorities arrived. The police did not believe Sharon's version of events. They suspected that she had attempted to rob Francisco and had shot him when he didn't comply. She was quickly arrested for homicide and assault with a deadly weapon. The mother of three maintained that she didn't want to hurt anybody, but had to defend herself. The police discovered the gun and ammo in her handbag, and further guns and ammo in the hotel room she was sharing with Francis. Francis was also arrested. His crimes included entering the country illegally and carrying an unlicensed firearm. One of the weapons retrieved from the hotel was found to be the same one which had killed Patricia Jones, but because Sharon had been acquitted, she could not be retried for this crime. Both Francis and Sharon were tried in the summer of 1965. Francis was cleared and deported back to the US, while Sharon was found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in prison. She attempted to appeal her conviction, but was given a further three years behind bars, as the court didn't believe that she'd been given a long enough sentence. In jail, she was nicknamed the Gunfighter, a name which was soon after adopted by the media. On December 7th, 1969, Four years after her conviction, Sharon was found to be not present for the 5 p.m. roll call in prison. However, her absence was not noted until a few hours later. It wasn't until 2 a.m. that her disappearance and presumed escape were reported to the Mexico City Police. A large-scale manhunt ensued in the days following Sharon's vanishing act. The police suspected that she may have been going to visit a former inmate whom she'd grown close with, but they also notified the US authorities, including the FBI, in case she attempted to make her way back home. Authorities initially believed that the prison guards had been bribed to look the other way as Sharon made her escape from prison. An atypical blackout had occurred around the time she vanished, and a door had been left unsecured when it should have been locked. Additionally, there were fewer guards on duty at the time, theories began circulating about what may have happened to the mother of three. Some suggested that her mother had helped her escape, others that she had a boyfriend who was in the police force and he had been responsible for helping her flee. In the years since, it has been suggested that she disguised herself as a man to leave the prison and the country, while a 2002 article from the Southeast Missourian suggests that Francisco's family had helped her escape so they could kill her. The search for Sharon lasted until December 18th. 
Investigators said they suspected that she had gone to Guatemala, although it's unclear how they reached this conclusion. Sharon had become fluent in Spanish due to her time in prison, and authorities believed this would help her blend in better and allow her to go anywhere where Spanish was the main spoken language. In December of 1969, investigators announced that they'd run out of leads in the case. After her failure to turn up for her fourth trial in October of 1964, a warrant for Sharon's arrest was issued. In 2010, it was still outstanding, and was, at the time, the oldest outstanding murder warrant known to exist in the Kansas City area. Sharon Kinney's fate is still unknown. She is described as a white woman with gray eyes. At the time of her disappearance, she weighed 125 pounds and had blonde hair. She is five foot seven and has a skin pigmentation disease with a red port wine scar on the left side of her face. If she is still alive, she will be 83 years old. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.